here. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce Jonathan today. Um, Jonathan recently graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison as a chemical and biological engineering student. And today he is here to talk to us about machine learning guided engineering of fatty acyl ACP reductases. And he is currently a data scientist now at A Alpha Bio. So Jonathan, whenever you're ready, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Great, hey, cool. Thanks, Meg. So yeah, um, like Meg mentioned, I'm Jonathan, and I'm going to be talking about some work that I did during my PhD, which is engineering fatty acyl ACP reductases using machine learning to help guide our approach. So I'll give some background first for um, the project and why it was something we were interested in, um, why the specific enzyme that we worked with was something we were interested in. And it all comes back to production of fatty alcohols. So fatty alcohols are really valuable chemicals. Um, they're currently most commonly made from either chemical synthesis or from harvesting plant oils. Um, however, there's some major environmental drawbacks of this. So the, the chemical synthetic route involves some catalysts that have some pretty nasty um, side products. Um, and then getting fatty alcohols from plant oils can lead to pretty massive deforestation problems, especially for the more valuable fatty alcohols, which you can pretty much only find in like palm and coconut. Um, and so an alternative that we've looked to for producing these chemicals is making these uh, kinds of chemicals and microbes. So once we figure out how to make the fatty alcohols, they're used in all kinds of different things like flavorings and surfactants, I think is most commonly what they're used for. Um, but the way that we make these in microbes is by taking advantage of the fatty acid uh, by a synthetic pathway. So briefly, how this is going to work is we have some carbon source, some sort of sugar um, that the cells, the bacteria, or the yeast are consuming um, through um, a glycolysis that gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Um, and then the acetyl-CoA can get converted into uh, a couple of different kinds of in intermediates um, through a series of chemical reactions that gets converted to this molecule called acetyl-acetyl ACP. Um, and ACP is acyl carrier protein. So that is, a, that is actually a protein um, tag that is stuck to this molecule. And that helps the cells uh, recognize what this um, what this sugar is going to be used for. And so this ACP helps guide it through all of the elongation uh, machinery needed to make these longer uh, blocks of fatty acyl chains. And so, um, so basically you're condensing these acetoacetyl ACPs with malonyl ACP subunits, um, and you're elongating this chain by two carbons at a time as you um, go through this cycle. And that builds up this pool of acyl ACPs. Once you have acyl ACPs, these are long, basically an ACP attached to a thioester and then a long lipid or long um, alkyl chain. Um, these are the basis for most of the lipids in E. coli um, and yeast. And so these are very um, useful starting points for making chemicals. And if you can find a way to get two fatty alcohols from this, this is a pretty good way to go. So pretty standard routes to get to fatty alcohols from acyl ACP is by getting rid of the acyl carrier protein with a thioesterase, swapping it out for a coenzyme A, and then using an acyl CoA reductase enzyme um, to make fatty alcohols. Another route that's less common um, due to re reduce activity of enzymes is actually to just go directly from the acyl ACP to fatty alcohols. So using an acyl ACP reductase or a acyl CoA reductase that is uh, more promiscuous. So um, this reaction is not one that's been um, studied as much, um, but that's a reaction that would be desirable, particularly because it reduces the need to use an equivalent of ATP to refunctionalize um, an acyl-CoA to make into an alcohol. So 
we set our sights on using an enzyme called MAACR. Um, this is an acyl-CoA reductase from Marinobacter aequiloi. It was discovered in around 2010 or 2011 um, and characterized by uh, Willis and Wallen um, at Minnesota and Utah State. And um, it was pretty well characterized for being able to produce fatty alcohols. Um, there's a couple of cool things about this enzyme. It has two catalytic domains. One of them takes the acyl ACP or acyl CoA, converts it to an aldehyde. Um, and then the next one takes that aldehyde and converts it to an alcohol. What's really nice about that is that it sequesters the aldehyde and it, it potentially reduces the effect of toxic aldehydes in cells by just channeling the aldehyde directly from the acyl thioester reductase domain that's carrying out the first reaction to the aldehyde reductase. Um, so in this way, this enzyme is able to make a fatty alcohol essentially directly in a two-step reaction, um, which is pretty advantageous. Um, and it, additionally, there's been some studies that have shown some moderate activity on acyl ACPs. Um, so not very high quantities of activity for that, but that's something that has been observed. Um, and so because of this kind of dual activity, we decided to use this as a starting point for engineering an acyl ACP reductase with improved activity so that we could make fatty alcohols um, directly from acyl ACPs in cells. So now how are we gonna actually achieve that? So there's some canonical protein engineering strategies that we could try. And I'll talk about why we did not choose some of these in a minute. Um, but just some brief overview of these strategies. Rational design is a pretty classic protein engineering technique where you have a structure of a protein um, and you know some information about the activity and the catalysis. You can pinpoint some key positions in the protein and then you can mutagenize them. Um, and you can do this in an iterative fashion where you kind of sample different positions, and try different residues and um, use the structure to inform the choice of mutations that you make. The advantage of rational design is that library sizes are very, you know, they don't need to be very big um, because you do have quite a bit of information about the protein. Uh, so you can keep the, the number of positions relatively small. Um, contrast, if you don't have structural information but you have access to say a high throughput screen, you can use directed evolution, which is a super powerful method um, for engineering proteins. Uh, the idea of directed evolution is you start off with your wild type protein sequence and you randomly or systematically mutate it, but in pretty massive fashion. Um, and then you have some sort of screen that allows you to select from this massive pool of sequences that you've mutagenized and pick out what is the most fit variant. Um, once you've done that once, you can then put the improved variant back through um, your, mutage your mutagenesis protocol um, and you can mutate it some more, you can basically accumulate beneficial mutations over several rounds, gradually improving the activity of your protein each time. Um, these methods can be combined, so you can have direct evolution coupled with rational design, and that's also pretty powerful. Um, but there's some cases where these don't work very well. So right here is a cartoon of a graph showing kind of how the relationship between these methods and the amount of knowledge and throughput we have in an assay. So rational design, as I mentioned before, works really well when you have a lot of structural knowledge. Um, you can get away with some pretty low throughput if you have a high amount of structural knowledge. Um, but if you don't have a lot of structural knowledge, rational design is going to work very well because you don't have enough confidence in the positions of your proteins. Uh, side chains or residues um, to be able to make good decisions. Directed evolution, on the other hand, works really well um, regardless of the amount of structural knowledge you have. You basically don't need to have a structure at all to be able to do directed evolution. Um, the trade-off is that you need a high throughput assay or at least medium throughput in order to really do it effectively um, because most mutations tend to be detrimental um, and the number of possible mutations for a given protein can get pretty big. Um, directed evolution definitely works best when you can screen through millions to, um, to billions of sequences. So MAACR is definitely not filling either of those quotas. So I've got a third category here, which is machine learning based engineering. 
Um, and I think that machine learning can help complement directed evolution and rational design by kind of filling in some of these gaps um, where we're lacking structural knowledge and where, where we're also lacking in throughput. So MAACR, I think, probably falls somewhere around here on this curve. Um, there is not a crystal structure. Um, there is an alpha fold structure now. So uh, the, these slides are dated automatically because alpha fold was not a thing when this um, work was first done. But, um, but yeah, there was not originally a crystal structure. And in order to really assay the activity of this protein, we were reliant on GCFID. So basically, uh, chromatography assay, um, which is pretty low throughput. So our solution to this dilemma was to use machine learning um, to try to complement our structural knowledge gaps and to help make up for our gaps in assay throughput. And we did that by using active learning. So just really briefly, this is an outline of how we are utilizing active learning to um, help us in engineering these enzymes. So we had an initialization phase where we used some experimental design to design a test set of several sequences, about 20 sequences, um, just designed to give us a broad view of what the protein function landscape looks like. Then we kind of enter the design test learn cycle. So we start off with a testing round for um, where we just look at how much fatty alcohol is getting produced by these by the cells expressing these proteins. Um, so we designed an assay to probe that. Um, we put the different strains through that assay, and then we can get the data from the GC, and we can feed that into our learning modules. Um, and this is where we're learning the mapping between the function and the sequence of the proteins. Um, we use that to then inform design of our next sequences. Um, and so we design these in batches, about five to 10 sequences each round. Um, and we use some optimization strategies, which I'll discuss later, to help um, figure out what sequences we wanted to build. And then we would build those sequences and repeat the cycle. Um, and we iterated through this several times until um, we were able to get some results. So, oops, went backwards. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about one of our strategies for um, mutagenizing proteins. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can shuffle or change a protein sequence. You can do random uh, mutagenesis with error-prone PCR and basically just sample uh, single and double mutants uh, all over the protein. You can do site saturation studies. Um, but the strategy we chose to use was a little bit different. We chose to use a recombination approach. So the idea of this recombination strategy is that a protein consists of these functional blocks um, or modules that we can we can kind of identify from structure or sequence information. Um, and each one of those modules has a specific role or function. Um, another thing with this is that modules from homologous proteins can potentially be swapped in. So if you have two homologous enzymes um, and you have a similar module in each one, you could try swapping those modules and putting them in the non-native enzymes and seeing if that changes um, the activity or enhances the function in any way. Um, and the advantage of swapping modules in this way is that it, it tends to preserve um, important features of the protein structure. Um, and so you're more likely to get functional variants if you um, make libraries from recombination as opposed to just making a bunch of random mutations. So in order to use a strategy like this, we have to first define a couple of parameters. You have to pick some parent, some Sorry, we have to pick some parental enzymes. Um, and then we have to identify where are the boundaries between these modules and how do we figure that out? Um, and then some advantages of using this approach, like I mentioned before, we have a high probability of maintaining the function of the enzyme. And it makes for a, actually a really easy sequence encoding for machine learning models. Um, it makes feature selection extremely easy and, and streamlined. Uh, because instead of having to deal with every single amino acid at every single position, you just have a couple of key blocks. Um, so your number of variables is pretty manageable. So to select some parent enzymes, we looked back to some work that a colleague of mine in Brian Flager's lab at UW-Madison had done. Um, he had been working with um, acyl-CoA reductases as well. Um, he specifically was working on making fatty alcohols um, 
using some pretty cool custom built strains of E. coli. Um, and he did some work where he was characterizing several different homologs of um, merino bacteria aquilase, acyl-CoA reductase. Acyl -CoA reductase. Um, he built a sequence similarity network based on the structure of MA or based on the sequence of MAACR and identified several homologs um, in different clusters that looked like they might be promising. And he tested them all in his um, in his in vivo assay. So this is work done by Chris Mayer in Brian Flager's lab. Um, of the seven acyl-CoA reductase sequences that he tested in that strain, only three of them uh, produced alcohols. Um, so, and they were all located in this same cluster here in his sequence similarity network. Um, so for a starting point, we thought that that would be a good place to go uh, where we have these three sequences where we know they're active um, and we know the sequences in this cluster are more likely to be functional acyl-CoA reductases. Um, and so we selected uh, these three enzymes to be the parents for all of the um, recombined proteins that we would make later on. Uh, so it's Merinobacter aquilis ACR, which I mentioned before, another acyl-CoA reductase from a different species of Merinobacter, and then uh, acyl-CoA reductase from methylivium. So after we selected those three sequences, we started playing around a little bit. So like I mentioned before, these enzymes have two catalytic domains um, and we started off pretty big picture. Um, we, know, we knew roughly where the boundaries between those domains were just based on sequence homology. Um, and so we wanted to see if we just swapped these domains around, um, how would things look? Uh, so we designed an assay, and this is the assay we use for the rest of um, the experiments or the rest of the in vivo experiments in this talk. Um, and so the way the assay works is we have our E. coli cells, they have a normal fatty acid elongation cycle, um, but they have this enzyme called FADD knocked out. Um, FADD is the enzyme that uh, replaces, um, that converts fatty acids into acyl CoAs. Um, and so without a functional FADD, there's no way for fatty acids. Um, to get converted to these CoAs and it basically knocks out anything, any CoA activity um, that there might be in the cell. So, or any, um, any potential pools of acyl CoAs that there might be in the cells are eliminated. So the only source of thioester for an acyl CoA reductase to access would be acyl ACPs. Um, so with that, we put in our acyl CoA reductase or ACE, or um, we put in our acyl ACP reductase variants. Um, and if we produce fatty alcohols in the assay, um, we can see that on the GC and um, we can learn from that, apply it going forward. So we made these shuffles. These are the, these top three sequences are the wild type sequences. So I've labeled them A, B, and T based on uh, which parent enzyme they came from. And then down here are the shuffled ones. So we swapped the aldehyde reductase domain um, and the acyl-CoA reductase domains and tried all nine combinations um, just to see what would give us the best fatty alcohol production. So when we did this, we found, um, we actually observed quite a big improvement in the activity just by making these domain swaps. So specifically uh, this fusion of A and B, we found had about a one and a half fold improvement over the wild type sequence. Um, and we found that enzymes that had the, the aldehyde reductase domain from MAACR, which are um, A in this figure, had generally higher activities than those that did not. Um, so we decided to select, we wanted to keep the aldehyde reductase domain constant and focus our mutagenesis efforts on the acyl-CoA reductase or the acyl-ACP reductase portion of the enzyme. So we selected these three enzymes, um, which are one is a wild type and two are chimeras um, to recombine further. So these are the parents going forward for schema recombination and for all of the mutants that we make later on. So I mentioned schema recombination. Um, so schema is an energy function that we use as part of an algorithm to figure out where breakpoints go. So 
breakpoints are those boundaries between the modules of the enzyme. So we identified the boundary between the aldehyde reductase domain and the aso coa reductase domain just based on um, sequence homology. But when we wanted to get a finer um, view into it and zoom in a little bit on the aso coa reductase sequence, it's a little more difficult um, with there being not as much structural information about it. And um, it's just a smaller bit of sequence to focus on. Um, so how we decide where the modules within that small portion are. So the way the schema energy function works is if you have, if we have a chimeric protein and a wild type protein, we can look at amino acid pairs within that structure. Um, and any pairs that occur in the wild type where the amino acids are within a certain radius, get a contact score of one. Um, and anything in a mutant where uh, the amino acids are the same as in the wild type gets a delta score of zero. Um, but if the amino acid for a given pair is different, uh, when you make a domain swap or a block swap, then you get a delta score of one. And then you multiply these together, you sum them all up, and that's basically the schema energy function. Um, what the schema energy function does is essentially penalizes um, mutations that are specifically breaking contacts between um, uh, important contacts in the wild type structure. Um, so what we did is we generated a contact map for MAACR. Um, we used some homology modeling software, so we used Modeler to generate um, about 100 models based on six different templates um, that had roughly 30 to 40 percent sequence identity. So not super high identity, but high enough that we had some confidence in the fold. Um, and so with those homology models, we built this contact map, and then we run the schema algorithm, uh, schema RASP algorithm to help find where good breakpoints go. Um, and this fits into a bigger picture or a bigger algorithm called the RASP, which is uh, recombination is the shortest path problem. And what RASP does is basically turns the trade-off between um, the schema energy function or the schema penalty and the number of mutations that could occur in a library. Um, and it turns that into a shortest path pro optimization problem. Um, so RASP identifies basically any libraries or any set of breakpoints that um, simultaneously optimizes the number of possible mutations, which is something that's good and minimizes the schema disruption score. Um, and so anything that's showing up on this darker gray section here, this is the Pareto front um, where the optimal libraries go. And basically anything along this front is considered an optimal solution. Um, if you decide to focus on one of the two objectives more than the other, it involves a trade-off. Um, and so we looked at this Pareto front um, after we ran the RASP algorithm on our um, on our sequences, and we selected a set of breakpoints that corresponds to this um, dot in the plot here. Um, and that locks in where the boundaries between the domains go. So that's showing on this um, plot here. So just showing it again, uh, but now with some nice color-coded visuals for where the blocks go. So here's the contact map. Um, here are the final solutions from the schema RASP algorithm based on what we selected. Um, and then this is what it looks like on our homology model. So we can see, get a feel for where each of these blocks go. Um, we have a preliminary idea of what some of the importance of these blocks might be. Um, and we can kind of use this to help us um, make these mutants. So um, another thing to note here is anything inside one of these squares um, is a contact that can't be broken um, by making a mutant uh, by swapping out a different block. Any, any dot that shows up outside a square, that's a contact that could potentially be penalized by the schema energy function. Um, so the RASP schema algorithm is basically just trying to find boundaries that give us as many things within these boxes as possible. Um, so 
we've got our final library design now, we've got our set of breakpoints, so we can actually start building these sequences. Um, so then the question is, what sequences do we go and build? Um, do we just pick some random sequences? Um, do we, what's the best way to do this? So if we were a little bit more high throughput, we could probably make a combinatorial library um, and just make everything um, and test it. And that would be really, really cool. Uh, however, our throughput does not allow that. So we decided to go about it a different way. Um, we could have chosen to make some random sequences and it probably would have worked pretty well, but we decided to try to use um, some kind of design of experiment techniques. So we set up a greedy algorithm to look at these possible chimeras um, and basically identify a set of chimeras that maximizes the amount of information that we get. So we're essentially optimizing the Shannon entropy um, as we calculate. Um, so we, we calculate the Shannon entropy each time we add a sequence to the, this set of sequences that we're going to build. Um, we'll test all of the other sequences in this computation and see which one gives us the biggest boost in the entropy. And then we'll keep that maximum entropy um, and sequence in the set for future iterations of the algorithm. Um, so it's a greedy algorithm. It will accrue the best sequence each time. And we run this for 20 iterations until we get 20 new sequences that help us hopefully get a good picture of what the landscape looks like. So I've color coded these here. So this does correspond to the actual library that we built. Um, so this is our initial test set that we're going to use for going forward. So we test these in the GC experiment. Um, and then we start using some machine learning tools. So we found especially helpful early on um, applying a classification step was very beneficial. Um, it helped us kind of weed out things that weren't as likely to be active. And the way that we trained our regression models later benefited from um, having a classification step pre-filter things out as well. Um, so after we classify whether we think a sequence is going to be active or inactive, we train a, um, we train a Gaussian, um, process regression model on the data. And we use that to predict which sequences are going to have the highest activity. Um, and we also importantly, we calculate, um, not only the predicted mean for the sequence, but we also calculate the uncertainty associated with that prediction. Um, so this is called, this allows us to do something called upper confidence bound optimization. So if we think of a model, um, so going back a little bit, if we think of this as this black line as our protein fitness landscape that we don't know yet, but that we're trying to discover, we can think of a model as this green line, um, and that would be the model mean or the model prediction. And then the uncertainty or the error bars in that mean would be this gray space here. So since we're starting off with nothing, our mean is basically a straight line across the whole landscape. It's just a, you know, just a guess. Um, and the uncertainty is basically, basically the whole, the whole space. Um, but as we gather data, if you test a sequence in this landscape, it shrinks the confidence intervals around that sequence. And you get this Gaussian kind of Gaussian behavior here um, where you can start to predict, um, you can start to look at these confidence intervals and do some optimization. So we pick a sequence, we decide to build that sequence, um, we test it, and then we repeat this process. And once we've gone through this cycle once, we then have a new, um, we have a candidate that we can go about for the next round. So the first sequence is basically random, um, but once we have some information, we can actually calculate what sequence has the maximum upper confidence bound, which is just the sum of the mean and the confidence interval. Um, so once we select the upper confidence bound, we can repeat the cycle systematically selecting the new upper confidence bound each round um, building that, testing it, and that should converge to the optimal enzyme sequence rather quickly. To speed things up even further, um, we used batch mode upper confidence bound optimization, where um, instead of just doing one sequence at a time, we predict one sequence, and then we computationally assume that that sequence's actual experimental readout is the same as its predicted mean, 
Um, and that allows us to then simulate additional rounds of upper confidence bound optimization within a single uh, design round. Uh, so we generate five to 10 sequences each round using that strategy. Um, and then we clone them using Golden Gate cloning. Um, and we repeat this cycle over and over again. So, um, so yeah, so going forward, this is a figure showing what the sequence landscape looks like in kind of three dimensions. So I took the sequences of all the chimeric enzymes um, and I did a dimensionality reduction to get it into a nice like triangle shape uh, where the vertices correspond to the, the parent enzymes. Um, and then I mapped the predicted activity to the Z axis here. So this is showing the walk through the, the um, function landscape as we went through these experimental rounds. So I'm showing each dot is the maximum sequence at a given point. Um, so we were able to use this algorithm to basically climb up this hill um, iteratively and get close to the top. This is what the actual data looks like. So we have our fatty alcohol titers on the x or sorry on the y axis, um, and the x axis is each experimental round. So the wild type or the parent enzymes are shown here in orange. It took us several rounds um, before we actually beat the best parent enzyme. So this is. Um, this is the parent for schema recombination, but it was also still technically a chimeric enzyme and a novel enzyme. Um, this is that uh, fusion shuffle from earlier on that had higher activity. So the best wild type sequence is actually this dotted line. Um, still, it took us three or four rounds to actually get above um, the wild type activity levels. But once we did, we had better data uh, for training the model and that helped uh, the helped that the algorithm do much, much better in subsequent rounds. So by round eight, um, round eight and nine, we basically found the optimal sequence within this subset of chimeric sequences um, for producing fatty alcohols from acyl ACPs. So we wanted to do some additional validation once we found our best enzyme. Um, the first thing we wanted to look into is, is this like just an expression thing? Um, it would be kind of anticlimactic to think we'd done this cool optimization strategy just to find out that all we really did was find an enzyme that's more soluble. Um, so we did a quick expression test, um, kind of a semi-quantitative uh, test of expression where we doped in a standard curve consisting of purified MAACR and ran that on a protein gel compared to cell extracts from uh, these other enzymes. Um, to get a rough idea of how well things are expressing. And based on our experiment, it didn't look like there was a real significant difference between our best enzyme, which is ATR83, and our um, starting enzyme and our wild types, um, which are these parents. So we didn't see a significant difference in the expression. Um, if anything, we saw maybe slightly lower expression level for our best enzyme than for our starting and our wild type sequences. So. Uh, nothing really super conclusive from that, but what really um, did stand out was we did some um, some in vitro work to verify the activity of this enzyme. And I have to give a major shout out to my undergraduate on this slide. So Sarah Falberg was an undergraduate I worked with who helped me with protein purification. Um, and just looking at this slide, you wouldn't realize how much protein purification goes into this experiment, but it was a lot. Um, so without going into all the gritty details. Um, it wasn't just purifying these four enzymes, it was also purifying acyl-ACP and the enzymes to functionalize acyl-ACP. Um, and so it was, it was a lot, um, but at the end of the day, we were able to get all the purified proteins we needed to do uh, some kinetics assays with uh, palmitoyl ACP, which is um, the predominant substrate of the reaction in the cells. And what we found was our top enzyme that we identified from upper confidence bound optimization had about the same KM as um, the top parent enzyme, but it did have a, about a one and a half fold improvement over the, um, the KCAP, which corresponds pretty nicely to the improvement that we saw in, in vivo as well. Um, so based on the confidence in the experiment, we we're very confident that um, the activity that 
we engineered using this upper confidence found in machine learning based engineering strategy was actually um, the kinetic activity of the enzyme and not just expression or solubility or something like that. So uh, we, we did improve the activity of the enzyme. Um, and we're really excited about that. Um, and we can especially see how dramatic the uh, comparison is to the enzyme we started with, which is this parent A. Um, this doesn't even have a KM that could be calculated um, because the fit was so bad. Um, but based on looking at the graph, it looks like the KM would probably be a bit higher um, and the KCAT would be quite a bit lower. So uh, we did have a pretty big success with this experiment, looking at the in vitro rates of the reactions. Um, so once we had verified that we actually did optimize activity, uh, we wanted to do a little bit of follow-up to figure out what exactly are like the sequence and structure features that are, that are doing that. Um, and so we have a lot of mutations to consider here, and it's not really possible to break it down into single mutations just based on the sheer number. Um, but we can look at these, we, going back to the discussion about modules, we can go back to these modules and we can think about these blocks as um, kind of discrete modules that can tell us about what they do. Um, so here I'm showing the final um, final model. So just the actual activity versus the predicted activity and the model is performing really well. And we use that model to generate these kind of coefficients. Um, these aren't really coefficients because Gaussian process regression isn't a parametric model, but we kind of backed out these coefficients using predictions and um, looking at abundance of um, or looking at the activities of each of the enzymes in the actual data. Um, and so these give us an idea of how important that particular block is to the function or how detrimental it is to the function. Uh, the higher the magnitude, the more the stronger um, the effect is. So um, we've mapped these colors onto this um, model of the protein. Um, and there's a couple of positions that I thought were particularly interesting. So first is the active site. Obviously the active site would be a position of interest. Um, so that's blocks four and five. Um, we can see that here. So this is the catalytic tetrad um, close to the NADPH. Um, we saw some pretty strong preferences around the active site. Um, so particularly parent B at position four was very strongly preferred compared to the other two. And then parent T uh, we found was pretty strongly not preferred pretty much across the board, except for at this position, which is the NADPH binding site. This was really interesting um, because this was definitely the worst parent, um, the worst wild type. And then when we shuffled that aldehyde reductase domain in from the other parent, it still wasn't very good. Um, but for some reason, um, this particular block of sequence from that parent makes the activity improve quite a lot. Um, and this um, block was found in all of the best enzymes um, that, we, that we found. Um, so it could be doing something, um, have something to do with um, how it's binding to the NADPH. We can't really make very solid structural claims about it, but we can say this probably has something to do with why. Um, so NADPH binding is probably a factor here. Um, but there could be some other factors as well. Uh, another really interesting pair of sites is near the terminus of the enzyme. So uh, for some reason, there was a very high magnitude of scores at these last two positions. Um, and so we think this may be where the acyl ACP binding site is. Um, we did some follow-up work to look into this a little bit, but for, we found that um, this block from parent B again, was very strongly preferred and it was present in all of the top chimeras. Um, and that was surprising because it looks like it was maybe a little bit on the disordered side, um, close to the terminus. It didn't really seem obvious what that would have to do with the activity of the protein. Um, so we decided to do a little bit of docking. We did a docking simulation in Rosetta um, based on some information we know about acyl ACP and, we, um, and where the active side of the enzyme needs to be, we can kind of prime it to do a quick docking simulation. So we found, um, we kind of position this close to where we think it should dock. And then we ran the docking simulation um, to see what positions it generated. And then we looked at residues within 
that wound up being within 10 angstroms of um, the final docking output. Um, so those are shown in red on this structure. This is the acyl carrier protein. Um, I'm not showing the actual acyl part of it, but this is just the protein itself. But we found a really interesting thing here. So um, when we look at those amino acids within that 10 angstrom sphere, um, we notice that the sequences that we're generating, or sorry, not generated, the sequences that we generated and that had high activity all had some pretty consistent patterns. Um, so if we were to think of our um, chimera sequence as a sequence of letters, um, there were eight positions. Um, so each one, each one of these characters would be a position. Um, block four, block seven, and block eight made up a motif that was found in almost all of the high activity um, enzymes. Um, this plot is showing the fatty alcohol titer against what we calculated the net charge of um, the enzyme within that uh, 10 angstrom sphere would be. So this is a pretty um, back of the envelope type calculation. We basically just count the number of positively charged residues and the number of negatively charged residues within that sphere and get the net. Um, so um, it's pretty, um, it's, it's kind of a loose calculation, but it's something that definitely points out a trend that we are very interested in. We found that enzymes that had a higher positive charge or higher net positive charge had higher activity. Um, and of those, these darkest green enzymes have three out of three of these important blocks. Anything that had two out of three of those blocks is lighter green, one out of three is the lightest green. And then if it doesn't have any, um, then it's one of these, these white empty, empty circles. And you can see this pretty strong trend here. Um, whereas you increase the charge, you increase the activity. Um, as you increase the number of these important blocks, you increase both of these things. Um, so looking a little bit more into that, um, this is kind of a multiple sequence alignment of those three parents at just the positions within that sphere that are different um, and that can affect the charge. Um, the optimal set of blocks based on what we are seeing in the data, you can see um, a pretty clear trend towards increasing positive charge, which makes sense from what we were looking at on the slide before. Um, so lots of lysines, lots of arginines, um, uh, trying to minimize negatively charged residues, um, eat the comms here, the different options of um, parents. But um, so yeah, these are the, this is like what the alignment looks like. And then when we look at the actual structure or model of the structure, this is where these charged residues are in comparison to each other. And, in, and then in comparison to um, where we think the ACP is binding. Um, so it looks like this would be a very promising way to get about improving activity even further by optimizing charge um, near this region. The reason for this is that acyl ACP is a very highly negatively charged protein. Um, it's kind of unusual in that regard. And so um, increasing the number of positively charged residues at its binding interface is a way that um, other researchers have used to try to improve binding of acyl ACP. Um, so we were able to use our Rosetta calculations and our predictions from machine learning models to help us kind of identify some of these trends that map to structural and sequence information. Um, so just a really quick recap um, of the project, we started off with our enzyme MAACR, uh, which was identified uh, as having some moderate acyl ACP activity. Uh, we did some bioprospecting, not, not really us, but our coworkers, collaborators, um, had done some bioprospecting, and we used that um, set of enzymes to identify a wild type that was better um, and that had higher activity. And then we recombined the wild type enzymes to generate these new parents, um, again, boosted the activity about one and a half times. And then finally, we used our schema recombination and upper confidence bound optimization approach um, to generate enzymes that had another one and a half fold improvement over the previous best. So all in all, we improved the activity of the enzyme about five fold from the starting sequence, about two fold over the best wild type, which was um, an, 
not something that was known before, but um, still, if we're comparing to nature, we only did about two times better. Um, but then we also validated that we had about a one and a half fold improvement in the KCAT over our 